It's always a good day to be a Christian. Hmm? Always a good day to have, them, have God on your side. It's always a good day to be on God's side. Because if you pick a fight with God, you'll lose. We're going to look at the ultimate example of that this morning. We're studying uh, uh, from now through Easter. We're taking little, uh, snapshots of the cross to get uh, a, a, an image, a, a picture of what was going on in, during this time and what goes on beyond the cross and the other side behind the cross. So uh, this, th today we're going to talk about um, that moment in time where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and uh, they've come to put him under arrest, okay? Stand with me for the reading of the Word of God, please, this morning. Our text comes from the book of John, John chapter 18, we begin with verse number 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. So this is after the Lord's Supper. Uh, they had gone down, downstairs through the streets of Jerusalem, through the gates, across the Kidron Valley, and, and they're heading up the side of the Mount of Olives where there was a, uh, a garden. What was the name of the garden? Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane. What does Gethsemane mean? It means uh, oil press because it's the Mount of Olives. So they would gather the olives and they would take it down to the oil press and they would get the olive oil out there. And that's what the word Gethsemane means. It means the olive press. So Jesus would often, remember, uh, Jews have to, Jewish men are required three times a year to go to Jerusalem and present themselves before the Lord. So three times a year, the place was just completely covered over with, with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And so they would just be everywhere. And Jesus would often go to the mountain of, of uh, Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. He had his favorite spots out there where he and his guys, they would spend the night like many others did. So that's what's going on now. Verse number two, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons, because Jesus is a dangerous criminal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, crooked politics, all right, from way back in the day. Verse four, Jesus, therefore, now listen. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him. Now, he knows he's about to be arrested. He'll be beaten all night. He'll be crucified the next morning at 9 o'clock. At noon, God will turn out all the lights. He will become sin on the cross of Calvary. 3 o'clock, he's dead. By, before sundown, he's buried. He knows all that's going to happen to him. The, the, the horrors of it. That's why he prayed so hard there in Gethsemane. Father, if there's any way possible, let this, let this cup pass from me. Because of what is going to be required of him over these next 24 hours, okay? Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? You know, I, love, I just love that. When Jesus looks and sees this, yeah, all his enemies come and he looks and he just walks toward them. He, he don't run and hide, he, he walks forward. I love that. Verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered. Now listen to this. This is very, very important. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. That is the gospel. That is everything in a nutshell in one phrase. If you seek me, then let these go their way. Let's pray. Lord, again, we love you and we thank you and we praise you for the, for the day of the crucifixion of Christ Jesus, our beloved Savior. Lord, we're so sorry that you had to go through all that, but we're so glad that you did. We pray now that you'll open our hearts and our minds and our imaginations, Lord, and help us to, to see beyond the, the words on the page and see what was going on there in that, uh, that fateful time so very, very long ago and how it has a deep abiding effect on the very lives that we live and our eternal souls as well. I pray now that you would fill me with your spirit to bring this message for you, for your honor, your glory, for you and you alone are worthy. We love you, we thank you, and we praise your blessed and holy name in the magnificent and holy and lovely and glorious and almighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 You may be seated.
There was once a mighty guardian angel who guarded the glory of God in heaven. But he discovered that uh, all that power went to his head. And he discovered what it was like to lord it over his other angels. He invented a language called the lie. And once corruption, corruption began to form in his heart, it found no boundaries and no ends. So this once holy and mightiest of all angels got kicked out of heaven. God uh, judged him there, burn off his wings, condemned him, kicked him out of heaven, threw him out like a sack of trash. Jesus said, I saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. Well, we know him today by his other name, Satan. Satan means adversary. Everything that God is, Satan said, I will become the opposite of it. If God is love, I'll become hate. If God is righteousness, I will become sin. And so God allowed the, 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 the production of, of an arch enemy, of a nemesis. Now, what really got Satan in trouble was this. Because he, the Bible says, he said in his heart, this is over in Isaiah and in Ezekiel. I, he said in his heart, I will, I will exalt my throne. I will sit on the sides of the north. I will put my throne like God's. I will be like God. That was his original plan. He's going to take over heaven. Well, then he got busted and he got kicked out. Now he's the devil in the darkness and all that. But his original plan had never changed. All down through these millennia, the devil's plan is still the same. One of these days, by hook or by crook, preferably by crook, that he's going to find some way, some method, that he can find a way to get back into heaven and claim it all. Now, in, 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 in the mind of, of the devil, here's what he's got going on. You see, there's always been multiple thrones in heaven. Remember when uh, we talk about Jesus, where's Jesus today? He's seated at the... Father's right hand, right hand of the Father, which means, you know, there's at least two thrones there. So here's the thing. God has the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and as long as Christ is up there in heaven, then, you know, he's out of reach, and he's, uh, there's no, you, you can't get to him, as the devil is thinking, okay? So if he, could, if he could lure him out of heaven, if he could get him out of there, get him down here in the, in the cesspool of the earth where sin is, get him down here, then he'd have a better chance, a better shot, at doing something to Jesus to get him to sin. Now God's problem is that he loves us. And so down through all these years, now we're, we're covering thousands of years just like this, right? Because we've got to get out of here uh, by lunchtime. So, so down through all these years, mankind has sinned and the way to sin is death. And so the devil bought the rights to the souls of mankind in the Garden of Eden so that all, you know, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death like we're talking about in our Romans road. Now, all of this has been very, very gratifying for, to, for the devil to, to, to torture and to kill and, and uh, do all that he's done down through these millennia. But on the other hand, it was always just to flaunt this in the face of God to get him to come down out of there and take some action. And he knew God loves us, and that's for he hates us because he's the hatred of God. Now then, we, we, we are, are, are pawns on the chessboard here, and God so loved the world, though that he gave his only begotten son. Now the Bible tells us, and we've talked about this in earlier sermons, and, and how that, that the Bible says that Christ was willing to take on the mission of the salvation of the souls of mankind. He was willing to take on the mission of coming down here and, and taking our sins to the cross of Calvary and to die for them there. We've heard this a thousand times. Christ Jesus died for our sins on the cross. And so he came to earth, but here was the, here was, here was the legalities of the deal. It's this. Jesus is going to come down here and he's got to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He's got to live a perfect sinless life. So all the years that Jesus was down, he took on human flesh and he walked among us, God in the flesh. All that time, not one single time did Jesus ever sin. The Bible says that, that uh, he, was, he was without sin. He became sin on the cross. Who knew? No sin, all right? So all those, all those 33 years, he never once broke a single solitary commandment of God that his obedience to the Father was absolute, infinitely perfect. Not in one iota did he ever break the will of his heavenly Father. Well, now it's time for the crucifixion. 
And so the devil's going to turn up the heat. Because here's the thing, here's the deal. The devil says, look, if I can get him to sin, he and everything he owns belongs to me. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. When they sinned in the Garden of Eden, they became the property of the devil. And everything that they owned, and all of us, we've inherited the sinful nature. It is just hardwired into our DNA to break the laws of God. We can't help it. We do it all the time. And so if Jesus breaks the laws of God, he becomes a sinner just like the rest of us. Also, I want you to get this, uh, this, this mental image in your mind. When Jesus left heaven to come to earth, there's a vacant throne next to the Father. Right? All right. A position's open. Because what was his original idea? I will exalt my throne. I will be like God. Satan wants to be co-regents with the Heavenly Father. Can you imagine? The Heavenly Father on his throne and the devil on the throne next to him instead of Jesus? No, thank you. But this is the deal. But it's, the stakes are high because if Jesus lives the entire time and he goes to the cross and he suffers through everything imaginable, yet if he does it completely without sin, without disobedience to the Father, if he's faithful to the Father all the way to the end, then the devil loses everything. And his fate is sealed. And there's no more deal. And Jesus is the victor. Are you with me? These are the legalities of the court of heaven. And that's, the, that's the, the high stakes drama that are going on during this time when Jesus Christ comes to earth. And it's the fate of all mankind hangs in the balance during these 24 hours when Jesus is going to be crucified. So now the game's afoot. And so uh, uh, Jesus had the, the Lord's Supper. And uh, the Bible says that, that Satan entered Judas. So Judas, one of the disciples, Judas who betrayed him, Judas was not just demon-possessed. He was possessed by Satan himself. He was the, he was the glove that the, that the devil inhabited. He was the puppet that the, that the devil had control over body, mind, and soul, and spirit. So if you had your spiritual glasses on and you were there with Jesus and the other 11 disciples and, and Satan was there, then Jesus is looking through Judas and he's seeing the devil sitting there too. The Bible says that, that Jesus took the, the sop, the, the special morsel. You know, he's the head of, he's the guest, the head of the table here. And they would take a, they would dip some of the, the food and they would, and he would hand it to someone as a sign of honor. And by the way, before this, Jesus had washed the feet of Judas. And wrapped them out around that. And so Jesus takes this sop and he dips it and he puts it in the mouth of Judas. And again, this is a snapshot, a picture of Jesus putting himself into the mouth of the serpent. And the Bible says after the morsel entered into Judas, the devil entered into that. So now Jesus is looking at, at, at Judas, but he doesn't see just Judas there. He sees the devil himself, his arch enemy. Now the devil knows why he's there. It's, it, it's his time. The Bible says, calls this the... the uh, uh, this is your hour and the power of darkness. So Ju Ju uh, the devil has been given free reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. So he goes out and he makes a deal with, uh, with the uh, Jewish officials. And, and they give him some money. They say, well, we don't know where he is. He said, I know where he is. And so gathers up. Now, this is, a, this is not just a, a little posse of six or eight guys. Okay? This is a big bunch of armed men. These are, uh, are the professional guard at the palace. These are the important people. These are the, uh, the money men. And these are the politicians. And these are all the henchmen. They gather up uh, lanterns and torches and weapons. So it is, a, it is a group of hundreds of soldiers with torches and lanterns making their way through the streets of Jerusalem and Al Kidron Valley and, the, and leading the way is, is Satan wrapped in Judas? Because Judas knows where, he, where the Lord is. He's up there where he always is, the Garden of Gethsemane, and his favorite little trees up there. 
where they sleep in, in, among the roots. So he leads them up there, and the devil's thinking this is it because he's got permission from God to do these things. This is all part of the deal that was stricken before the world was ever formed. Now here's Jesus, and he's up there, and his disciples are sleeping, right? Good old disciples. And he's prayed so hard about this that his, the, uh, the capillaries in his, in his, his sweat glands are ruptured, and he's, his sweat becomes his blood because of the turmoil of his soul and spirit at what he's about to have to face. And yet knowing all things that happen to him, when he sees them coming, this, this angry mob with their torches, he goes forward to meet them. Now here we are, we got the face off, okay? Get this idea in your thing in your mind. On one side you have God in the flesh, amen? You got God in the flesh, and on the other side, you got the devil in the flesh, because it is Judas, remember he's inhabited with Satan himself. And so the devil comes up there, and Judas and all these armed men, and then Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they all say, Jesus of Nazareth. And by the way, you still hear a lot about Jesus of Nazareth uh, in our common culture on TV shows and all these other things. When people refer to Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth, they're talking about the historical figure. Like you could talk about George Washington or, or Gandhi or anybody else. They, Jesus of Nazareth is that fellow that grew up over there that we know a lot about. You and I do not call him Jesus of Nazareth. You and I call him Jesus Christ the Lord. Christ means Messiah, the Holy Anointed One. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are you looking for? Are you looking for the Christ? No. We're just looking for Jesus of Nazareth because we got plans for him. And so G Jesus fills his lungs, God in the flesh, and he says, I am he. Now if you will look at it in your Bible, you'll see that the word he is in italics, which means it's been added by the translators for clarification. Because what he really said then, if you look at it, what did he really say? He said, who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am. Amen? Who else in the Bible said, I am? I am that I am. Moses said, I, who, what's your name? I need to tell him what your name is. Who are you? And God Almighty boomed from Mount Sinai. He said, I am that I am. I am the self-existent one. I am the never created one. I am the eternal, almighty, infinite God. Who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus. I am. And listen, the Bible says in, 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 the, in the text, it says they all went backwards and fell, and fell down. Now, I've got... We, we, we got hundreds of, of trained soldiers and men here. Why did they all fall down? They said, oh my goodness, how shocking. Why did they fall down? Because Jesus said, I am. And it was the power of the presence of God Almighty that laid his enemies flat on their backs before his feet. Amen? Because listen, the devil's thinking, boy, I've got you now. I have got you. There's no escape for you. I've got men, I've got demons, I've got torches, I've got weapons. You cannot get away from me. You, you are mine and I have captured you. And the Lord Jesus Christ wants to make it clear, as he said in John 17. He said, I lay down my life. No man takes it from me. I freely lay it down. By the way, the other, other half of that, uh, of, of that song is this. He said, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it back up. But that's the Easter story, okay? So Jesus says, look, I, uh, he wanted them to know, he wanted everyone to know, he is not being taken captive. He is not being, uh, he's not been tricked and outwitted. He is not being hemmed in and chased down and hunted and captured. He's not, a, he's not a victim. He's not a captive here. Because at any given moment, he could just walk away anytime he wanted to. He said, Father, he said, don't you know, Peter, I could call my Father in heaven. He could give me more than 12 legions of angels. But no angels are coming to his rescue because he's not there for him to be rescued. He's there for us to be rescued. He's not a victim. He's not a captive. He is the ransom for our souls. So he wants to just make this little clarification here. Oh, you think you've caught me? You think there's no way out? You think I can't just walk off anytime I want to? You think I can't just say the word and there'll be nothing left of Jerusalem but a greasy spot? You can't catch God. You can't capture God. He has to be willing. He has to be the will of God. And so Jesus is praying, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. If this is what you want, dear Father, then this is what you get. But just make sure everybody knows. He said, I am. And he slapped them all flat on their backside. Just so you know, you haven't caught me. 
I go willingly. Now, you and I know about kidnap victims. We know what kidnappers are after, right? The kidnappers catch somebody, they haul them off and spirit them away, and they get a phone call, and they said, well, uh, or they leave a ransom note, and they said, I want a million dollars in small unmarked bills, and I want to order a pizza, and I need a helicopter. Right? That's what it works out in the movie. And so the, the guys come in and they make the negotiation. The idea is this. The, 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 the kidnapper saying, you give me the money, and I'll give you this person that we got to kidnap. I'll give you the captive. Right? So we know what a ransom is. A ransom is what you pay to get your beloved back. A ransom is what you pay to get your beloved back. Jesus Christ is not there as a victim, as a captive. He's there as a ransom. He is there to be what the Father is willing to pay to get his beloved back. Now here's the devil, flat of his backside, in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at this moment, the only one left standing is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Flash forward to Judgment Day. It's already determined that every knee will bow. Things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? So there's a picture of Judgment Day. The devil and all his henchmen and all the demons are slapped flat on their backside in the presence of God Almighty as he stands as God. And so uh, it says, he asked him again, I asked you, who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I've, I've told you I'm he. Now listen, that's the last flash of the glory of God that Jesus is going to exercise. Because now he takes that power and that glory and that might and that position that he has rightfully. He takes that and he lays it aside as well. He gives it away as well. Remember, he's pouring out everything there is. He's giving up everything in heaven. He's giving up everything on earth. He's given up every protection from the things under the earth. He's submitting himself to everything. Now he knows what's in the cup and he knows what he's facing. He knows that, that in a few hours on the cross, at, at, noon, at noon that day when, when the lights go out, he knows that he will have to become sin on that cross. The very essence of what sin is. He has to become not just an innocent bystander, not just a, a substitute, not more than that. The Bible says he was made sin. Not made to sin, but made in the very essence of sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God. Now when he was on the cross of Calvary, and by this some uh, alchemy that only God understands, that the Lord Jesus Christ became the sin of all mankind. So that as God and as man he can be the great go-between now his his torture and his torment and and his brutalization come in every flavor and form imaginable and then some because now sin on that cross a sin on that cross all from from heaven all the wrath and anger and hatred and judgment and punishment and, and rage that God has against sin is all poured completely and fully and totally upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He punishes, punishes, punishes. Everything he hates about sin, Jesus Christ had to take it. And on the other end, here's the devil. And everything the devil hates about righteousness, 
he dumps on the Lord Jesus Christ. His rage, his anger, his hatred, his wickedness, his everything, everything he's got against God, he pours it out on the Lord Jesus Christ. So on the one side, you've got the Father pouring out his wrath and anger against sin. On the other side, you've got the devil pouring out his wrath and anger against righteousness. And Jesus Christ is stuck in the middle, and he takes it all. He takes it all. And that's what he's there for. So the last part of our text says this. He said, I'm I've told you that I am he. Listen to this last phrase. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. From before time, the devil had been seeking him. It's all part of his grand scheme and plot. For all these thousands of years, he was after him. Oh, we, he hates us because God loves us, but we're just pawns. Some way to, to lure Christ out. Get him to sin. And so on the cross of Calvary, he's, he, he's punishing and he's hating and he's ripping and he's torturing and tormenting. And at the same time, he's offering away. I say, oh, you know, if you'll, if you'll just re remember the temptation in the wilderness, if you'll just say one word, if you'll just, if you'll just bow your knee, if you just one little, one little infraction of the laws of God, oh, this will go away. This will stop. You can be free. And that's the torment that Jesus went through on the cross of Calvary. But the thing is this, I will be the ransom, but that means the Lord's beloved, they all have to go free. Let these go their way. And so in the great, unbelievable miracle in the Bible, here's what happens. The Heavenly Father gathers up His precious beloved Son, and puts him into the greedy, bloody claws of the devil himself. And he says, do your worst. Do your worst. Do anything. There's no restriction. Do anything you want to with my son. Because that's the price to be paid. That's the ransom to be paid. So that you and I can go free. When the Lord Jesus Christ had spent those six hours on the cross, he'd become sin. He took everything of the wrath of God, every drop of it, and all the hatred of the devil, and he, he suffered through it all. And not one single moment did his resolve fail. Not one single time did he yield. Not one single moment did he abandon the will of his father. And take out the will of the devil, not one single time. So that finally when he had suffered enough for heaven and earth and hell, when he had suffered enough, and he said, it is finished, Father, in my hand, I commend my spirit. And when the spirit of Jesus stepped outside the broken body of Christ on that cross of Calvary, when, as the Bible says, that silver cord was broken, that binds spirit to body, when Jesus died, at that moment, everything changed. At that moment, the deal was over. At that moment, the devil lost everything. At that moment, his head was bruised by the heel of the victor, not the victim. At that moment, the gates of hell were ripped off their hinges and thrown away. At that moment, Jesus Christ claimed the, the keys of death and hell. And at that moment, he doubly earned the right to be called by every living creature, human and spirit, King of kings and Lord of lords to the glory of God the Father. Amen? And because of that, people like you and I can simply humble ourselves before God and say, Dear God, I want Jesus to be my Lord, my authority. Save me. Keep me out of hell. And by the way, I need some help today as well, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll turn myself over to you. Do for me what I cannot do for myself. I live a perfect life because I can't. Get me a place in heaven because I can't. All this has to be done by the Lord Jesus Christ. Give me strength for the day. and Give me uh, power over my own sorrows and failures. And help me be a better person. Help me be a good Christian person. A answer my prayers and do all these things. We, we, we're desperately in need of a Savior. And because of the mighty work that Jesus did on that cross... Because he was willing to make the great exchange. Because of that, you and I could just call 
on the name of the Lord and be saved. Not only the salvation of our soul that gets us to heaven, but I tell you what, I need a little saving every day, don't you? Dear God, save me from this mess I got myself in. Dear Lord, save me from the things, dangers that I'm not even aware of. Dear Lord, save me and rescue me and constantly be taking care of me and looking out and providing for me. This is the Jesus that we serve. And he's glad he paid all that. And he'd do it again if it was necessary to become our ransom, to become the payment to the bad guys so that his beloved could be set free. Amen? So, who do you look for? Who are you seeking? Jesus asks. What am I to you? Who am I to you? Oh, you're Jesus of Nazareth. You know that guy that lived 2,000 years ago? He was a carpenter. They killed him and all that. We talk about him on Christmas and Easter. Or are you looking for Jesus the Christ, the Lord, the Savior, the Ransom, the Son of the living God, King of kings and Lord of lords? That's who I'm looking for. Not you. Let's pray. Our almighty, loving, heavenly Father, our Lord God, our Savior, our friend, we're so grateful that it is you firmly seated at the Father's right hand in the glories of God's good heaven. Thank you, Lord, for what you paid. Thank you for the journey you took, Lord, and every, every bit of the honor and the glory and the accolades rightfully go to you, Lord God. And we want to thank you that you're still sovereign and almighty and infinitely holy, Lord. And we are also very, very relieved and thankful and grateful that you are so very much on our side. Thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for strength. Lord, thank you for your blessed presence. Thank you for your word. Thank you for heaven. Thank you for life here. Thank you, Lord, for all you are, all you've done, and all that you've given us. We love you, and we praise you in Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.